So our first reading today is a story that comes from the Acts of the Apostles, and it's, it's one of my very favorite stories, and it's, it's one that's paired with another story, which we should have heard last week, except that we were celebrating St. Mark's Day, which is the story of Philip and the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch. And in that story, Philip is sort of nudged by the Holy Spirit to enter into conversation with this eunuch and to explain to him the good news that's in Jesus Christ and to show him how the scriptures have been pointing to Jesus. And at the end, he's baptized. In this story, this is the story about Peter, St. Peter. And in this story, Peter has been in a city called Joppa where he's had a vision. And in the, in the, he had a vision of this, this blanket coming down with all of the foods that they're not supposed to eat. I assume it's like lobster tails and scallions and that kind of, or not scallops, that kind of thing. Um, and in the vision, God is telling him that the, the old ways, the, the food laws, what we think of as kosher, no longer apply. That, that, that's something that's being set aside as God is doing something new. And then after he has that vision, he has this, this vision, this, this calling of the Holy Spirit to go and find this man named Cornelius. Now Cornelius was a centurion, a Roman soldier, an occupier, sort of the, the enemy of Israel in lots of ways. And yet Peter is called to go to him and his family. And they live in a, a city called Caesarea, which is a, on the Mediterranean coast. And uh, at the same time, Cornelius has had a sort of a vision from the Holy Spirit telling him to invite Peter into his home to share a meal. Now, this is actually really challenging for Peter, and he has some people who are with him, um, some fellow followers of Jesus, but all of whom are, are Israelites, Judeans, Jewish people, as we might think of them today. And, and this is a really big deal because they're not supposed to eat with people who aren't also Jewish, right? That there's a, there's a law about this. But Peter's just had this vision that some of the food laws don't really apply anymore. And so they go, probably somewhat reluctantly, to go and have dinner with Cornelius. So while they're having dinner with Cornelius, something happens. And it's not really clear exactly what happens, but something happens that shows to Peter and his companions that the Holy Spirit is in their presence and has come and entered into the lives of Cornelius and his family. Later on, when Peter is called to account for this and has to go explain to the council in Jerusalem about why he did this, he explains that when he saw what he saw in Cornelius and his family was very much like the experience that he and the other disciples had had when the Holy Spirit came into them at the Pentecost, which is two weeks away. So at the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit entered into the disciples, you remember, and they were up in that locked room and afraid, and it, it kind of draws them out into the street, pushes them out into the street where they encounter the, the crowds of Jerusalem and begin speaking to them, and they're given this gift where they can speak to people in their native language, or at least people can hear them in their native language. And the good news of Jesus begins to spread, and Peter tells them that the same thing happened with Cornelius. Because in the crowd in Jerusalem, everybody there, of course, was Jewish. But here is something new. And we have these two twin stories of, of the Ethiopian eunuch and the story of Cornelius. And they're sort of happening at the same time. And what's really I love about this story is what's miraculous and amazing about this story is not that the Holy Spirit is active in Cornelius and his family. Because the truth is the Holy Spirit is active in our lives all the time. The Holy Spirit is always around us, surrounding us, calling to us, inviting us. What's really miraculous about this story is that Peter and his companions recognized what was happening. That they saw the Holy Spirit in action in what was happening to Cornelius. And this is the thing that I think we miss out on too often. That because we get distracted by our own fears, our own ambitions, our own stuff, we sometimes miss the Holy Spirit calling to us in our lives. That we feel like we know what God might want for us, and so we don't listen closely when God is calling us into something different. I remember very clearly um, when I was in seminary, I was about ready to graduate, 
And it's, uh, I was called on to do the sermon for our, our weekly community Eucharist in the seminary. So this is all the professors and the staff and the students that gathered once a week for this Eucharist. And, and as a, a senior, I was called on to do the, the preaching. And I remember because at that time, I, had, I was from the Diocese of Oregon. I lived in Portland, Oregon before I went to seminary. And in the Diocese of Oregon, um, I was getting ready to graduate, but they... Um, they didn't really have a place for me. And so the bishop had said, well, you know, you're going to graduate soon and, and you can be ordained, but uh, I don't really have like a church or anything for you to go to, so hope you find something. Good luck. It was a little nicer than that, but that was basically the gist of it. And so when the day came for me to preach this sermon, I, I'd actually had some luck and I had sort of two invitations before me to go and serve communities. And one was in southern Kentucky, and the other was in West Virginia. And I remember this because I remember saying in this sermon that if I had known when I came to seminary that I was going to be a small-town southern preacher, I might not have come. That was not the vision that I had for myself. That is not what I thought God was asking me to do, and yet... Here I was, that clearly this was a, at least a waypoint on my journey. And I ended up going to um, southern West Virginia, and, you know, I was reluctant. I had never been to West Virginia, although, like, that's where my ancestors lived for a long, long time. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but, like, where I grew up, West Virginia doesn't have, like, what you'd call a good reputation. It's a challenging place in lots of ways. Um, and so we were all a little reluctant to go there, but it turns out that it was an amazing and wonderful experience. I served this community called St. Stephen's Church in Beckley, West Virginia, the seventh largest city in West Virginia, I'll have you know. And, uh, and it was a wonderful experience. It was a wonderful community to welcome me as I, I began to figure out what it meant to be a clergy person and a priest. It was a community that taught me so much, many of it by doing things wrong, but also gently showing me the right way. And the years we spent there were years that were filled with many, many good things. My, uh, my daughter had her earliest memories there. That's where she began school. My son um, was born there. And so it was this joy that I was called to this place. And, and I remember it so fondly and with such love. And of course, the time came when we were called to go elsewhere. And I ended up at St. Luke's, which is really actually that also was not my choice. There was another church that I was actually interested in, and uh, the, the person at the diocese was like, would you consider this other church as well? And I'm like, they, they, she told me what it was, and I, I'm on the phone, I'm looking it up on my computer, and her name was Judy, and I said, Judy, that's got to be the ugliest church I've ever seen. <laughs> and um, she goes, it's much nicer on the inside, which is true. It is much nicer on the inside. And I went to the other church that I was interviewing at and I would really hoped I was going to go to because I was just doing the St. Luke's thing, you know, for polit political reasons, right? And uh, I went there and that was a lovely church, lovely people, lots of resources, but nah, I really, I didn't feel that was my place. But then when I came to St. Luke's, I felt immediately as though this was a place I should be. It was a place that felt like home. And so I entered there. In fact, last week was my seventh anniversary of being there. And then a few years down the road, as we went through COVID and all of that struggle and difficulty, I'd had the opportunity to, to work with folks from, from this church, Dave Richmond, uh, mostly doing youth group kind of work. And, and I met Adrian a couple of times, but uh, I didn't really get to know him very well. And I did know Nelson. And... Um, you know, St. Mark's just kind of kept coming up in my consciousness, and I, I knew you were entering into a search, and I prayed on this a lot because it just felt like a, something I should, I should answer in some sort of way. I felt this compulsion from the Holy Spirit. And, and so I called up uh, Carrie, who was the, uh, uh, the transition person there, and I said, you know, Carrie, I, this has really been on my heart. I'd, I'd really like to, uh, to see if St. Mark's might be willing to, to entertain something that they hadn't anticipated or planned on, but 
but that I think might be good for all of us. And so in a couple of about six weeks, it'll be two years that I've been here, which is kind of hard to believe. And it was the same sort of thing that I I'd had the opportunity to celebrate Eucharist here a couple of times with the, with the youth, which was a joy. Uh, and then when I met with the, uh, the search committee, and it felt really good, and with the vestry, and, and we had some good conversations. And, and when I came here, it also felt like a place that was home, that I feel very comfortable here. It's a place that is filled with people who have been mostly really kind, But always, always from a place of love and devotion to this community and to our mission. And so we've been through, it's been challenging these last two years, right? We've had to deal with some, our financial stuff, and I feel like we're in a really good place with that. And, and we've come a long way, and it feels as though the Holy Spirit is so alive and active here. And these two years have been a joy, and I look forward to, to many more together. But sometimes, you know, the Holy Spirit calls us into places that we weren't expecting to go or that, that maybe we never even thought of. And yet if we take the time to, to listen and to find the places and the, and the activities and the people that when we, we come together, it's like our souls sing that there's this, this resonance that feels right to us. You know, it's probably the same experience that when you were a teenager, you might have called, you know, like love at first sight, but it's something much deeper and more meaningful than that. It's something that, that makes us feel alive. And I hope that all of us take time in our lives to, to pray and to study the scripture so that we understand how the Holy Spirit works in our lives and how we too can find the ways that God is calling us and, and maybe unexpected ways to take on things that we never thought we could do or to go places we never imagined we would be and to work with people that we, we would have never thought were the kind of people who would be our people. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. It draws us together into this community of love. And the love that Jesus speaks of isn't the love of, of romance or, you know, St. Valentine. But the love that is the kind of love where all we desire is that the other may thrive and do well and live into their potential. And that we're willing to do whatever we can to make that happen. And at our very best, that's what the church and this community is all about. It's about helping each other discover where God is calling us and what gifts we have been given and finding ways to employ them for the building of the kingdom of God. And when we listen to that Holy Spirit voice, when we take the time to hear where God is calling us and to let go of our ambitions and our anxieties and our fears and our own plans and to follow where God is going, well, then we're walking into the kingdom of God where there is abundant, joyous life. And really, what more could we possibly want than that? Amen.